Thank you all for coming. I uh, uh, we're going to get started because we're in a kind of a tight time frame because of the service at ten. So I wanted to tell you real quickly uh, a little bit about how this all evolved. And uh, Amy Stoffelmeyer and I were on a trip in January to Egypt and as a University of Michigan alumni group, and uh, we our guide ended up being. Hisham Minyawi, who uh, I, we just thought was so fabulous and knew so much about the antiquities of Egypt that we wanted to have him <coughs> share, share with you all. So we invited him to come and he agreed to do that. And so he's been here this week doing uh, lectures. There's one more tomorrow night it's, uh, at 7.30 here. <coughs> and it's on the antiquity, uh, or an ancient uh, Egyptian religion, which really very, very interesting. Uh, Hisham uh, is uh, educated in the University of Cairo. He's a uh, native of Egypt. He has family there, and uh, he's been doing lectures for 20 years in England and in Egypt, and this is his first one in the United States. So we have a wonderful. I'd like to introduce him. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, can, can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Uh, Give your camera. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really honored to be with you uh, today. And um, uh, I met some of you earlier on. And uh, I'm really glad to meet more of you today. Uh, as Nancy mentioned, uh, time is very tight because I know that there is a service running at 10 o'clock. So I would like just to cover um, some of the main subjects about uh, Christianity in Egypt uh, this morning. And uh, what I would like to say that Egypt is a very religious country. Since the beginning of the Egyptian civilization, and religion was one of the main issues in Egypt. A nation had more than 2,000 gods and goddesses. And when it turned to Christianity, they were very uh, 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 good and strong Christians. When it changed later on to Islam, they became very good Muslims as well. So Christianity and Islam are the religions practiced nowadays in Egypt. So Christianity in Egypt is very different from the rest of the world. In the way religion was introduced, in the way religion was accepted, and even in the way religion is practiced today. So in Egypt we have Christianity named as the Coptic sect, which is very Egyptian, you cannot find it anywhere else. Actually the story of Christianity or the idea of Christianity was there in the Egyptian mythology thousands of years before Christianity. As one of the main legends talking about the beginning of creation, mentioned God Osiris and his wife Isis, his brother Seth, and his sister Nephthys. According to the legend, they were the four, children's, four children of the gods. And one of them killed the other one. So Seth, the bad one, killed Osiris. Very much similar story to the story of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. The main core of Christianity is the divine birth of Jesus and the resurrection from the dead. So the divine birth in ancient Egypt was very well known, which made the Egyptians the most people able to accept Christianity earlier than the rest of the world because it was there already, so it was something common, it was not something odd to refuse. And the resurrection from the dead also was known in ancient Egypt because Osiris was resurrected from the dead. So it was easy to accept this new religion, especially that when Christianity was introduced to Egypt, Egypt was under the Roman occupation and they were suffering a lot. There is one main fact we shouldn't neglect and we'll come to talk about soon, which is the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt. The Holy Family came to visit Egypt and they were running away from 
uh, the Romans spent about three to four years within Egypt. So obviously they met many of the locals, many of the Egyptians, who heard the story about the divine birth of Jesus, and later on they were following the news of what happened to Jesus in the Holy Land, and when Christianity was introduced later on, they were ready to accept it. So, as we are going to go through slides, I just would like to mention something very important about Egypt. Egypt is one of the very few countries which has one of the largest collection of icons in the world. Because it was sort of a, a, a wave in Europe uh, in the 16th and 17th century, which is the icon clasm and destroyed large number of icons in Europe. But the icons in Egypt, especially those in St. Catherine in the heart of Sinai, on Mount Sinai, uh, Mount <coughs> Moses and Mount Sinai around this area, survived from the iconclasm and they kept still one of the best collection of icons in the world. So <coughs> this is one of the Coptic icons showing Virgin Mary. And Virgin Mary for the Copts is something very, very important. Maybe not like other sects in Christianity, but for the Egyptian Christians or the Copts, it's a very important figure. So, Virgin Mary and uh, the baby Jesus. This is one of the most famous icons, which is in one of the churches in Cairo, known as the Hanging <coughs> Church. The Hanging Church. I told you briefly about the legend of Isis and Osiris, so we'll go uh, quickly through it just to let you... Uh, 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 have a chance to understand the connection and how people accepted Christianity. Uh, uh, the body here laying down is the body of Osiris. After being killed by his uh, uh, brother, the bad one, Ses, uh, he was mummified and uh, he was buried and then he was resurrected from the dead. Uh, the resurrection, that's Osiris again, and that's his wife Isis. And by the way, funny to know that the official title of Goddess Isis was Virgin Mother Isis. Virgin, that's the official title in hieroglyphics, Virgin Mother Isis. Why she was known as Virgin Mother Isis? Because they haven't conceived the child Horus unless Osiris was resurrected from the dead. So if we go back to this slide, you find that Isis is in the form of a bird, like flying over his body and uh, receiving his seeds. So it was not actually like making love between Osiris and Isis. It, it was very symbolic that they had the child Horus. Here we see the falcon-headed god Horus. So virgin mother Isis and her husband, Osiris, who turned to be later on the uh, god of the hereafter, the one in charge of judging humans by weighing their heart against the feather of justice to find out if they were good or bad, and then according, accordingly they would be sent to heaven or to hell. That's the other sister, Nephthys. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, the king here actually was Seti uh, I. Seti the first may be not uh, very well known, but he was the father of the great pharaoh, Ramesses the second. Mm -hmm. And he was another great pharaoh. That, that scene is from his temple in a place called Abydos. And Abydos is north of Luxor, about mm -hmm. two hours drive, drive from Luxor. And he's holding like a pillar or a column. And that pillar is known as the Jed Pillar, which is the backbone of Osiris. And it's the symbol of resurrection. So he is offering the jet pillar to Isis as if he's telling her that I am supporting you to bring Osiris back from the dead and uh, uh, I will be joining Osiris when I die going to heaven. So you got to recommend me uh, to the afterlife. So this is the resurrection scene from uh, the temple of uh, 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 Abydos. Here we have a lovely scene from the Temple of Phila in Aswan. Uh, Osiris, after being uh, uh, resurrected from the dead, and Isis with the two wings because she had the form of a bird as we saw before. 
So most of the time she's shown with those two wings and like holding the body uh, of her husband Osiris. Uh, here we can see uh, uh, like a little comparison between the two pictures so you can understand the mentality of, of the ancient Egyptians when Christianity was introduced. Isis and the, the, the son Horus was already accepted and well known. So later on when, when Christianity was introduced, they found that Virgin Mary is very much similar to the idea of Virgin Mother Isis. Yeah? Okay. Here we can see also uh, two icons uh, of Virgin Mary and Isis. Now we come to the turning point uh, in the Egyptian history when the royal family came to Egypt, when Jesus was still a baby. This is also another beautiful icon from the church in Cairo and showing Virgin Mary carrying uh, the baby Jesus uh, on a donkey and accompanied by uh, Joseph the carpenter. Uh, when they came here to Egypt, we have to understand the political background at that time. Egypt was suffering a lot, or the Egyptians were suffering a lot from the Romans. They were uh, uh, treating the Egyptians badly, not like the Greeks before them. So they were suffering, they couldn't even practice their own religions and so on. Uh, something united the, 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 the Holy Family and the Egyptians because of the persecutions of the Romans. So they met the Holy Family. I would like to show you a map shows the route of the Holy Family into Egypt. They were coming from the Holy Land, that's Rafah in Israel now, and going into Sinai and reaching the Delta. And all these arrows showing the route of the Holy Family. Where they stop those little black dots, as you can see, this is where the Holy Family stationed for a while. Could be a week, could be a month, whatever. They spend like three and a half to four years within Egypt and going all the way down to the south to a place called Asyut. So you can imagine that they covered a long, long distance. And you can expect that they met lots of Egyptians within that period of time, within their journey. So they told them about the birth of Jesus and they accepted the, they were united and so on. There's no idea of Christianity yet. Christianity has not been uh, uh, introduced to Egypt yet. Uh, here you can see that was the end of their journey in a place called uh, Asyut, where we have one of the famous monasteries, the monastery of Deir el Maharraq, which is again north of Luxor. You can see Luxor here, that's Asyut. Uh, so when Christianity was introduced officially, in the year 61 AD, the Egyptians, by, by St. Mark, the Egyptians were ready to accept this religion for more than one reason. It's very similar to their own beliefs, and it is the religion of love and peace, which is promising them with a better life in the hereafter. He said, if we are suffering already in this life, so if we convert to Christianity, which is quite similar to the core of our belief, so we're not doing something wrong. This is one. Two, the religion looks like a religion of love and peace, so it might give them peace in the afterlife. They believed in the afterlife more than the, the first life. The first life was a very short period of time. Sooner or later, they will die. So they started converting to Christianity. What they never thought and expected, that when they convert to Christianity, will be like giving the Romans another good reason to give them even harder time. <laughs> they were already suffering, but now they give the, the Romans another good reason to give them even harder time. So they couldn't actually, they, 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 they were uh, thousands of early Christians in Egypt were persecuted and, and uh, uh, killed and died with bloodshed and were revolutions everywhere in Egypt and uh, confrontation with the Romans and so on and it's the time of the mortars in Egypt when many of the saints died and killed and so on and they have their relics now in many of the churches in Egypt. Relics and icons are very big things also in uh, uh, the Coptic uh, Egypt or uh, Christianity Egypt. So, some of them actually couldn't stand living in the cities. Also with the idea that we are 
Christians, we are devoting our life to God, so we don't really care about this life. So we should live somewhere isolated, we live far from the Romans, we live far from people and just worship God. Egypt was pioneer in many things, building the pyramids, in medicine, in astronomy, and even when it comes to Christianity, it was pioneer in Christianity. Although Christianity hasn't started in Egypt, but Egypt introduced many things to Christianity. One of them is the monastic life. The first monasteries ever been built were in Egypt. So this is another picture of the, the journey of the Holy Family. <coughs> Here, if you can see the Nile Valley, uh, on, on, on the east bank of the River Nile, the eastern desert, by the Red Sea, two of the early Christians, St. Paul and St. Anthony, decided to live there without knowing each other, but both of them went to live more or less in the same area. And they spent years and years there, uh, living on just a small piece of bread, a bird was bringing it every day, and a, a little well in the area. They haven't met each other until the last day of the life of St. Anthony, when St. Paul went to visit him and he attended his death. Those two saints, St. Paul and St. Anthony, started the monastic life in Egypt. And that was about the 2nd century AD. By the 4th century AD, the monastic life was well established and was introduced to the rest of the world. It took about like 4 centuries until the 4th century AD for Christianity to become the official religion of the empire, including Egypt, and since then, Egypt tended to be a Christian country. So the Egyptians started enjoying their uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion as well. Uh, here we have, uh, I'll come back to talk about uh, uh, this period, but uh, I would like to explain about this slide here. Uh, this is from uh, the Temple of Edfu, which is in Upper Egypt, uh, between Luxor and Aswan, and uh, it shows one of the battle scenes the one here, the figure here, is the figure of Horus, the son of Isis and Osiris. He was representing the good. So the good was fighting evil, and that was evil. The uh, uh, god of evil, God Ses, with his harpoon, is killing him. We find the same or similar figure uh, of Saint George fighting the dragon. Very much similar idea. Uh, the defacement here, we'll come to talk about this later on, uh, uh, was done by the early Christians when they were hiding in the temples and tombs from the Romans. And I will tell you later why they had this defacement. Here another picture. Uh, 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 the uh, goddess or the evil goddess was shown always in the form of either a donkey or a, 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 a hippopotamus, as you can see. It's a, it's a small size for for a hippo, but they mm -hmm. wanted to show that Horus is stronger and bigger and so on. The same thing with St. George and the dragon. And that's a fascinating one because this is from the Book of the Dead. This one here is from the Book of the Dead and you can see uh, they're killing a snake. The same thing here, that's a very famous icon in the hanging church as well in Cairo. And uh, St. George is killing the snake. See how similar uh, art was between ancient Egypt and early uh, Christianity. Uh, one of the famous symbols of Egypt was the key of life. The key of life or the key of the Nile. And we find that the cross is also the symbol of life. Also it's the symbol of uh, 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 crucifixion of Jesus, but also it's the symbol of life. So the key of life, which was the symbol of life, is very, very much similar to the cross. And this from one of 
the tombs in the valley of the kings. When the Christians were hiding, the early Christians, within the first three centuries, they were painting and leaving some graffitis. As you can see, this is one of them. And you can see some of the graffitis here, the Coptic graffitis and the cross. Yeah, That's from the tomb of Ramesses IV in the valley of the kings. So you can see, those are the legs of the Pharaoh, actually. You can see here. And that's like a text. And that's the cartouche of the king. The, the Coptic text next to it. Yeah? <coughs> that's from Ramesses IV. And this is from the Temple of Isis in, in Aswan, the Temple of Philae. The cross is deeply carved on one of the columns. The, the crosses, they look very much like Maltese crosses. Mm -hmm. And the Temple of Philae in Aswan, by the 5th century AD, and after converting to Christianity and becoming the main religion, they realized that Isis and her temple in Aswan uh, still attracting lots of followers of the old religion of Isis. So they decided, the governors of Aswan, they decided to close the temple as a temple and reopen the temple as a church. So the temple was converted, like many of the other temples were converted to uh, a, a church, a Coptic church. So um, the, uh, it, it was never used as a temple since, but it was used as a church until the modern time. Uh, also, uh, they, they, they were creative. When, when they found in most of the temples, we have always Trinity, uh, the main god, and uh, uh, two secondary gods. Could be his wife, daughter, his wife, son, uh, sister and brother, whatever. But we always have like a main god and two secondary gods. So this is from the temples of Karnak. And the one in the middle was supposed to be a Munra, his wife Mut, and his son Khonsu. So they chopped off the statues to make it look like a cross. Yeah? So very creative even uh, with, with uh, uh, vandalizing these statues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here uh, is the map of Egypt. I was looking for it actually, and it's uh, showing the location of uh, the monastery of St. Anthony. St. Anthony and uh, uh, St. Paul, uh, they were by uh, the Red Sea. So Sometimes I take groups to St. Anthony and St. Paul and I still cannot believe how these people lived almost 2,000 years ago in this place. Nowadays, in the modern time, with, with all the technology we have and current water and electricity and buses and cars, and it's still harsh. It's like in the middle of nowhere. So they must have had very strong faith and belief and uh, a strong will as well to, to, to live just individually in a place like this. Uh, the, when they started building monasteries actually, um, that was like I would say by the 4th century AD and taking its final form by the 6th century AD, uh, they, they were expecting raids from the Bedouins in the desert. They, they had food, they had uh, water, they had uh, animals and so on, so the Bedouins were raiding on uh, the monasteries. So they built the monasteries like a castle, mm -hmm. well protected and well fortified, as we'll, we'll talk about this uh, later stage. That's um, an icon of St. Paul and St. Anthony, and you can see the bird was bringing uh, uh, the half loaf of bread, and one day uh, it, it brought one complete loaf of bread, so uh, they knew that they're going to meet because they were expecting only half loaf so <laughs> he got a full one now so he's expecting a visitor to come St. Paul and St. Anthony and that's uh, the, the monastery of St. Anthony in, in the west, in the eastern desert that's a modern uh, picture and that's a new gate as well uh, the, these are the Coptic crosses and that's the inside of the monastery, and you can see it's just mountains. And they have a beautiful well there, which is used for uh, uh, irrigation. Uh, the monasteries in Egypt, they have fertile land by the Nile, in the Nile Valley. So across the desert, and they, they grow crops there, because they cannot grow crops in, in this area, it's not enough water. 
and that's how they support uh, their society. Uh, societies were evolved and uh, constructed around the monastery and was attracting lots of monks. To become a monk in, in, in the Egyptian monastery, you have to spend uh, at least three years as a trial period, and then uh, 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 the, the, the other monks would say if you can carry on or not and before they give you the permission to become a, a monk. That's a beautiful icon uh, showing uh, uh, Jesus and uh, Virgin Mary and uh, Maria Magdalena. And uh, now I would like to show you how the Coptic uh, church were influenced by building <laughs> temples. Uh, the Coptic church, they are like sort of basilican uh, churches, and uh, this is again the hanging church in Cairo, in the area which is known as Coptic Cairo. You can see like the, 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 the arched uh, windows here, and that's the inside of Karnak, and you can see the windows as well over there. Very similar design, they have like a main aisle in the middle, which is a higher ceiling than uh, uh, the two wings. And here you can see again very similar uh, uh, from inside. This is from the uh, monastery of St. Paul and uh, it's showing uh, 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 Jesus, beautiful painting uh, on uh, fresco. That's a clearer one here. And those four figures are the, the, the sons of Horus. You know, have you ever heard of the canopic jars? Yeah, the canopic jars found like among the uh, treasures of Tutankhamun. The canopic jars, each one should be with a different lead representing one of the sons of Horus and they are protecting the internal organs of the king. That's the plan <coughs> of the, the church and that's the plan of the Egyptian temple. The early churches in Egypt were temples. Before building churches on its own, they were using the Egyptian temples for about like three centuries as Coptic churches. There are places in Luxor, like the famous temple of Queen Hatshepsut. The name of the temple of Queen Hatshepsut in Arabic is Al Deir Al Bahari. And even if anybody has been to Egypt and you got the tickets, you find that the name written on the ticket is not the Temple of Hatshepsut, it's El Deir El Bahari. El Deir means monastery, and Bahari is a northern monastery. It's located further north. And the Valley of the Workers in Luxor, on the west bank of Luxor, is also known as Deir El Medina. Medina means town. So the monastery of town, or the town monastery. So that's an indication how many of these sites were converted to uh, uh, Coptic churches. That's a beautiful uh, uh, Coptic cross uh, from Philae, and that's the key of life. Again, the key of life and the cross. Right, here we come through like a couple of slides showing uh, the defacement of the figures in, in, in uh, some of these Tents. And uh, the, the defacement was done for a very good reason, actually. Because at the beginning of Christianity, they, they were looking, they, they converted to Christianity, yes, but they still believe in the other gods. They still believe in, in other religions. Yeah? Because a society with 2,000 gods, so it, it doesn't mean that when you convert to a religion that you are dropping the others. No. They were used to worship Horus and then respect Isis and then make offerings to Tot and so on and so on and so on. So when they convert to Christianity, they still believe that those gods exist. It's not just Christianity. Yeah? So they believe that if they deface the figures, if they damage the figures, especially the faces, it will stop those figures from being recognized to the afterlife. That's the most severe punishment. So either they stop the figures from coming back to the afterlife, or <clears throat> they can feel free when they practice Christianity in those temples, because it's totally forbidden in their old belief to practice a religion of a god 
in a temple which belongs to another god. You can have a great respect to all of them, yes, but if you are in the temple of Osiris, so you cannot make offerings to Isis, even his, his wife. You know what I mean? So they are practicing Christianity in the temple of Horus or in the temple of Isis or whatever. That's, that's not right. So they have to deface the figures so they cannot see them. They start with the faces so they cannot see them. And then when they had more time, they went for the hands so they cannot catch them. And then when they had more time, they went for the feet so they cannot walk after them or run after them or stand on their feet. When they had more time, they went for the whole body. <laughs> yeah? but, but the main thing was always the face. Maybe you have a clearer one here. Yeah, and that's, again, the defacement you can see, the whole body, yeah? So when they had the time, they went for the whole body. It depends on how long time they had in that area. Sometimes they were hiding in one of the tombs or one of the temples for a couple of days, so they don't have time to damage all the figure. They go for the most important, the face, yeah? The faces were the most important things to be damaged. And here is the inside of the Temple of Philae. It's not just defacement, what I'm talking about here, but also it's the ceiling. You can see this black on the ceiling. Because in ancient Egypt, nobody was allowed to live in the temple. Nobody was allowed to live in the temple. The temple was just the house of God. So it was built for the God and the servants of the God, the priests. They were not even allowed to live in the temple. They were coming to work, finish work, go home. So like shifts, three shifts, like a hospital or a hotel, whatever. When they finish, they go home. They're not allowed to eat in the temple. They're not allowed to use facilities in the temple. Everything was outside. That's just the house of the God. Yeah? You clean yourself up. Yeah? Get ready. Go there just to serve. When you finish your duty, you go home. So none of the, 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 the locals or even the priests was allowed to live in the temple. So they didn't need sort of elimination. They had, when they designed those temples, they had the windows in the ceilings to allow beams of light so they can use the reflection of this light on polished metals and it works better than torches. Yeah, torches or candles. When the temples were used by the early Christians, they didn't have to do the same thing because, I mean, they were living there day and night. So they were lighting torches and candles which left the black smoke on the ceilings. Yeah? They are working now on it for the last couple of years and they are removing that black smoke. And it's amazing what the colors uh, are revealing now. It's amazing. They, they tend to leave part of the ceiling as it is so they can show the difference between how it was before they do the, they've done the cleaning. Uh, so they see the defacement on the figures. You see that's the face of goddess Hathor, the goddess of love, beauty, uh, uh, music, and dance in ancient Egypt. And that's from her temple in Dendera. And the defacement of the face as well. That is a musical instrument, the symbol of a musical instrument on the top of her head because she was the goddess of music. And uh, that's the black smoke on the scene. Coptic language. Coptic language uh, it was one of the main languages used in Egypt for quite a long time, about like, I would say, at least uh, six centuries. The Coptic language is a later version of hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics was developed about 3000 BC, and uh, uh, it was deteriorating when Egypt was conquered by the Greeks and then the Romans and so on. But the latest version of hieroglyphics ever is the Coptic language. The Coptic language uh, was used until the 7th century AD when the Arabs came to Egypt and introduced Islam and Arabic as a language and people start to learn Arabic which was easier than Coptic language. But until now, until today, Coptic language is used strongly in most, if not all, the monasteries of Egypt. And in some of the main churches in Egypt, especially in the religious festivals like Christmas <coughs> and Easter, partly in Coptic and partly in Arabic, so people can understand as well. Yeah? 
So uh, it looks very much like hieroglyphics, those two manuscripts. And by the way, we have again one of the largest manuscripts in the world. Huh. And um, again, I would like to talk about the monastery of St. Catherine in Sinai, where they had one of the earliest Gospels of the Bible, which is dated back to the 4th century AD. It's known as Codex Sinaiticus. And one of the German scholars in the 19th century was sent by the Russian Empire. And the Russians were, uh, the Russian royal family was like a sponsor of St. Catherine Monastery. So uh, he had the permission to get the, 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 that early gospel of the Bible to translate it. Uh, and he promised to bring it back. He never did. <laughs> and it seems that it went to the Russian royal family, and then from there it went to Britain. Now it is in the British Museum. <laughs> so Codex Sinaiticus, which is from St. Catherine Monastery, one of the earliest Gospels of the Bible, back to the 4th century, in, in, in Coptic language, is in, in the British Museum nowadays. Is that one of the artifacts? that um, Egypt was interested in getting returned back? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, we've done a great job with getting some of the artifacts right. back uh, from, uh, from Israel and from the States. Yeah. We got two mummies uh, over the last uh, five, six years from the United States. And they were two important mummies, by the way. They were uh, the founders of the team and the 19th dynasties of Egypt. And that's a very famous period of Egypt. And they, they now they are displayed with their accessories in Luxor Museum. Uh, but the British Museum, Metropolitan Museum as well, and the Louvre is very difficult. Because when we had the restoration of the Sphinx in, in Cairo, the Sphinx originally had a false beard. And it's broken into three pieces. So one main piece is in the British Museum. So we asked the British Museum to give us, give us this piece back. And they refused at the beginning and okay, and then finally agreed and said, okay, we'll, we'll give it back to you, but in return of something we choose from the Egyptian Museum. Okay, and then what they went after, it was the most beautiful statue of the black dog, the jackal, Anubis, uh, from the treasures of Tutankhamun. So the Egyptian Antiquities Department refused. Said, okay, I mean, even if we put it back, it will look very artificial. But that might give you an idea about how difficult the negotiation is. Mm -hmm. Again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when we talk about being pioneer in, in Christianity, we have to mention the Coptic calendar. And the Coptic calendar is a later version of the Egypt, ancient Egyptian calendar. This is the calendar of Komombo. And uh, I, I can give you a very brief idea about it, how accurate and how uh, uh, clear this calendar is. Uh, actually, to read any of the, they, they thought that the year had only uh, uh, 360 days. So they arranged them in 12 months of 30 days each. And then later on, they realized that there is something wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah, because they were missing five days, so change of climate and so on. And it's an agriculture country. And so they, they said, ah, we're missing those five days. So they added them to the calendar. Yeah, and they made them festival days. They said they were not working in those days. Simply because they had explanation of something to do every day. Next to every day, you find something written here. So it's an instruction. What should you do? We call it the festival calendar because it marks all the festivals in Egypt, all over the country, all the year round. So every day it's like the, the 2nd of August you have uh, to renew the driving license. The 7th of <laughs> September is the birthday of my daughter and so on. Yeah? So uh, here you find the column with, with the numbers. And uh, number one is, is this one, little one here, which is like number one in, in English or in Arabic. And uh, that's number 10, uh, 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 sorry, that's number 10 here, which is, which is like uh, a letter U in English upside down. Can you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Or like a horseshoe. 
and that circle divided into two halves is number nine okay so from one to eight you count how many ones one two three four five six seven eight so these are eight ones but we have two tens so the number together will be 28 you got it and that's nine and two tens so 29 right what comes after 29 should be 30 so it should have three tens no because it's the last day of the month so they had a figure looks like a bird tail which is the end of the month <laughs> fill to the brim yeah no more counting of this month and then we come to the following one number one of the third month of the planting season which is the second season and then it goes on the second day third day fourth day fourth fifth day and so on yeah that's a list of festivals so you look at the day what day is and what festival and where yeah and then the second column is like instructions being given to to them concerning agriculture yeah so the first day of the calendar is when the Nile comes in a great inundation and it carries on like this yeah when I was young uh, and uh, I, I um, was talking to my grandparents sometimes I I hear them talking to each other they mentioned that we are going to do this um, in next month which is Brim Hat I never heard this name before what what name of a month is this you know I, I don't know I only realized this when I went to college to study Egyptology that these are the names of the Coptic month in the Coptic calendar which is a later version of the hieroglyphic calendar the ancient Egyptian calendar the name of the months exactly the same thing so the calendar was used in Egypt the Coptic calendar until 1971 AD <laughs> only 30 years ago or 40 years ago why did they stop using the calendar in 1971 AD because of building the high dam yeah everything was related to the Nile so the farmers knew it by heart we're doing this next month next month is when it gets cold and rain and so on we have to uh, collect the crops we have to do this we have to do that so everything changed since they built the high dam now they have current supply of water and they can have irrigation all the year round so there is no need to stick to this calendar so the Coptic calendar is a later version of this uh, uh, ancient Egyptian character. Also Christianity uh, uh, influenced art in Egypt. Uh, if in ancient Egypt they used to have the coffins, the sarcophagi with figures of uh, the, 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 the person uh, on, on the lid of the coffin, whatever, uh, when they changed to uh, Christianity they had similar thing and they sometimes they had mummification as well but they created what is known in, in the art as the Fayoum portraits. So instead of making big coffins and carving the faces on the coffins, they have like a picture painted and they, they place it uh, they place it on uh, the coffin. So you can see here even that little young boy or something like this and that is placed on the coffin to help in the recognition of this person in the afterlife so also they changed to another religion they compared it to Christianity they still influenced by the old beliefs what do you really need this for the afterlife no but it's like a tombstone yeah, yeah. the same thing so Fayoum portrays and uh, the inside of the church uh, that again I'm focusing on the hanging church because it's one of the most beautiful churches actually see how how busy inside the church and not only Christians go there but also Muslims you can see lots of Muslim girls with with the scarf going to the church it's it's like a big thing in in, in Cairo and you can see that um, the sanctuary over there is covered by heavy red curtains and the altar is behind the curtain the curtains are only opened in the big festivals. Okay, we go back to the Egyptian temples, we find that the sanctuaries of the temples were always 
locked behind a heavy wooden door. None of the priests was allowed to see the statue. None of them was allowed to get inside. Only in the big festivals, when the king and high priest put the statue in the shrine, hide it completely, they allow them in and they can carry the shrine on the shoulders uh, 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 to go to another place or to attend the festival or whatever. Uh, get back now to the monastery of uh, uh, the Eastern Desert and um, now we have entrances and stuff like this so you can actually walk all the way through but uh, uh, in the old times to protect the, 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 the um, um, monastery the, that was the entrance you see the ground level and that's the entrance how we, how we get up there yeah so they had elevators <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they were pioneer even inventing elevators. So that's the elevator. <laughs> you can see the lead, and it goes down like a little lift. Yeah, and it takes uh, one person at the time, so they can control who comes in and out. Yeah, and also it is used to deliver some food to the Bedouins. When the Bedouins have a raid on the monastery, what do you want? We want food. Okay, here's the food. Go away. Yeah? <laughs> so they don't have a direct contact with the Bedouins, and also if they have a visitor and they will let him in, so they can uh, uh, use this elevator. Uh, that's about the history of Christianity. What about Christianity or the Coptic uh, uh, community nowadays in Egypt? Uh, Egypt uh, is mainly an Islamic country, uh, population is about 87 million and we are increasing with about 1 million every year. Mm. We do have family planning and birth control but it works slowly. Uh, so uh, about 93% are Muslims, Sunni, and about 7 to 8% Christian. We call them Copts. But I have to explain this because it's a bit funny actually. Um, Copt means Egyptian. It doesn't mean Christian. Copts, Keptus, Egyptus, Egypt. You see the link? Yeah. So Copt means, in the ancient language, Egypt. When the Arabs came to Egypt in the 7th century AD, they were calling everybody in Egypt Copts. Yeah? Like when you go to Britain and call people they are British or French or Germans or Americans what yeah so they were calling everybody in Egypt Copts which is Egyptian but matter of fact the Copts were more than 90 percent Christians so it was linked Copt means Christian yeah doesn't only mean Egyptian it means Christian yeah. so those who converted to Islam became Muslims and those who remained Christians kept the original old title Copts. Yeah? So matter of fact, I can call myself a Muslim Copt. Yeah? You know what I mean? Because Copt originally means Egyptian, not Christian or, or anything. Yeah? So this is number one about the name. When Christianity was developed in Egypt, and especially by the 4th century AD, uh, there were lots of conferences in Europe to discuss the nature of Jesus. And the Church of Alexandria was one of the main five churches of the early Christian world. And the Church of Alexandria insisted on the fact that Jesus is one nature, partly human, partly divine. And he cannot divide them. Yeah? Which was different from the rest of the church in the world at that time. And led to the complete separation of the Egyptian church from the other church worldwide. So because it was separated, they started developing their own way of practicing, their own way of explaining things their own way of understanding the Bible and so on. So the, 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 the Egyptian Christianity 
although it is quite similar to Greek Orthodox in a way, we have more than 90% of the Christians in Egypt are Orthodox, or the Coptic are Orthodox, <coughs> and then second comes Catholic, and very small minority of Protestants. Most of them were European, came and lived <coughs> in Egypt. But the majority of the Christians in Egypt are Coptic Orthodox. But all of them again under the name Copts. Catholic are Copts, Protestant are Copts, and Orthodox, of course, are Copts. The head of the Coptic Church in Egypt is not just the head of the Coptic Church in Egypt, but it's worldwide. There are some Coptic Churches here in the States, in Europe, everywhere. They all <coughs> belong to him. His name is Patriarch. Shinuda, a very famous well-known man. He comes to the States uh, uh, a lot, actually. Visit many of the Coptic churches. And he's a very famous head figure in Egypt and in the Middle East and in Africa. Uh, because they were separated from the other churches and they were developing their own things, one of the priests in Egypt realized that it was a problem and a big mistake was calculating the birth of Jesus because it was calculated according to a, a solar calendar. But we should calculate it according to a lunar calendar. So in the 15th century, he said that it shouldn't be on the 24th of December. Uh, we should add the missing days from the time of Jesus until today. So we added nearly 10 days to make it early in January, 3rd in uh, January, and he advised to add every 128 years to make it a day later. So the 4th of January, then the 5th, then the 6th, then the 7th, and it was the 7th for, for, for a long time, 130 years, and uh, it, they changed only this couple of years to be the 8th of January. So that's why Christmas in Egypt comes usually uh, 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 about two weeks now, maybe more than two weeks than Christmas in the rest of the world. The same thing is with Easter. Uh, the Lent in, in Coptic uh, Christianity is very, very uh, um, strong. And you find that a large number of the, the, the Copts in Egypt are sticking to the Lent. The, the number of days of Lent in Christianity in Egypt is more than 250 days. And the right way to practice the Lent in, in Coptic Christianity is very much like Islam, that you stop eating and drinking until 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which is most of the day. So, so uh, they, they, uh, they should uh, uh, do as many days as they can. And even if they cannot stop eating and drinking for that long time, uh, they, they can only eat uh, vegetarian food. They are not allowed to eat meat or chicken or anything uh, uh, with a life. Sometimes they, in special days, they can have fish, but not all the Lent days. So it's very, very strict and uh, uh, they are a wonderful community. Uh, they, they have beautiful churches, they have lots of events taking place, and they insist on encouraging their kids to go to Sunday schools and attending the service on, on the service in Egypt actually is on, on, on Friday and Saturday. I think I, we have to finish now because <laughs> the service is coming soon now. Mm -hmm. So I hope that I covered, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a, a little bit about uh, Christianity in Egypt. and. Uh, I'll be glad to take your questions if you still have time and if you if you'd like to start going now to uh, the service, please enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're just brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy.
agency for, for organizing. Oh, you're going to be an agent. Oh, I didn't know you were talking to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It helps uh, educational Nora and John Harris. They live there and she's Egyptian because they insisted on the fact that Jesus is one nature, part of human, part of divine, which was not the idea of the other churches at that time. They believe that Jesus has two different natures. So Jesus on the cross was different from Jesus before, and that was the, the, the main conflict in, in the concept of Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But Jesus was both God. Well, now the understanding of Christianity and uh, the nature of Jesus is very different. But we talk about the fourth century AD. So this is this is why the uh, conference of uh, Nicaea and um, yeah, uh, Ephesus they, they were discussing that particular issue, and that led to sort of misunderstanding between. Uh, the Egyptian church and, and the other four main churches in the world. Hi. Let me ask a question about the detail that you had uh, the Holy Family <coughs> escaping and from the Holy Family from, from those places. Yeah. How, how do you know that? Or how uh, it's, that? Uh, the, the historian, the, the Coptic historians mentioned this. They, they wrote about it. And uh, that's the documentary. Yeah, there is uh, yeah near near the, the Coptic languages, uh, near the hanging church that I was showing here. There is another church called uh, San Sergius, and it's like a, a big chapel, and that was built in close in the cave, which is strongly believed that it's the cave used by the Holy Family when they were hiding in that particular area. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. How are you? Do you know? You don't know his name? He's a stage of the short stuff, very well. It's, it's really yeah, 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 because yeah, yeah. Um, and usually the guys living in Hogada they have different kinds of tours, so it seems that we don't get to meet actually a lot of them. But if you, if you have we did the we did the whole topic, mm -hmm. ah, if, 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 ah, okay. So if if you have his name or if you remember his name, uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, enjoyed it very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because sir. this was not an element that we picked up on at all. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right. One more question for another Please. day. Because every time I'm here, of course. Um, when the, when the religion changed from Christianity to Islam. Have there have been have there been strife and troubles with the people no. as a Christian religion, which is why they converted to Islam no. when the Arabs came in. No, not at all. The, I mean, uh, it it, uh, it it took like about four centuries for the religion Islam to become uh, the the main religion. So there was no pressure on the locals to to convert to a religion or so, and. Uh, it, it carried on the same way all all these centuries because I mean now you can you can see that the, the Coptic society is a very wealthy society and uh, they, 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 uh, they they have a great deal of business in Egypt and so on so there is no sort of uh, persecution to to the Christians in a way or another and was never the, the case because part of the the belief Islam which I think is corrupt now because of someone like Bin Laden or you know, these crazy guys. But the heart of Islam, I cannot be a Muslim 
un until I acknowledge all the religions and all prophets and all messengers of God before Islam. The main difference between Islam and Christianity that we we believe in Jesus uh, as a prophet, like yeah. Muhammad, like yeah. Moses, and so on. He's not uh, a god or the son of God. Yes. That's the only difference between. But we acknowledge Moses. Mm -hmm. We acknowledge Jesus. We we uh, 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 believe in the divine birth of Jesus, and we believe in Virgin Mary, and uh, we believe in the miracles of Jesus and everything. It's uh, it's part of our faith. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is strictly mentioned in, in, in the Quran that if you cannot, if you if you are not good to the uh, the others, especially Christians and Jews, then you cannot be a good Muslim. That's 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 not my word. It's it's in the Quran anyway. So uh, that back sort of background was very important to to enhance the relationship between the Muslims and Christians at the beginning and until now. So if it was sort of a pressure on, on the Christians in Egypt, it wouldn't take four centuries <laughs> to... No, they do it much longer. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. So that, that happened gradually and at ease. And um, Islam, when it was introduced, some other, forget about Egypt now, like India. India, uh, Islam was introduced through merchants who were traveling there and, and uh, exchanging things, goods, and, and so on, and selling and buying, and because they, they, they got to know them, and they found that Islam enhanced the personality of those people. So they, they liked it, and they started converting to, to Islam. The same thing happened with, with, uh, with the Egyptians, with, with the Christians in Egypt. So it took like a long time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just wondering how this, you know, if the Christians had, had felt, um, or if, if the uh, Egyptians had felt uh, under pressure and strife from the Romans and they picked up on Christianity, I didn't know whether there had been some um, difficulty as, as living a Christian life even before Islam well, actually, did, that made it easier for them to convert to Islam. Not that not that Islam was persecuting. Yeah, them, uh, but, I understand. But what you they mean. were no, having but, a difficult time. But as, for for as three centuries Christians before Islam, for three centuries. Uh, uh, the, the, the Christians were very powerful. They were actually doing the same thing to the pagans, and they they were persecuting them. And the 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 the, 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 the non Christians in Egypt had to pay for the suffering of the early Christians. Oh. It's That's the other way around. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's the time when they had the vandalizations of uh, the figures and the damage mm -hmm. of the statues and so on. Yeah, we understand this. I mean, the, the guy suffered for like three centuries and there was no reason for it. So now we have the power, so he got to pay back. So that, 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 that was what happened for like three centuries before Islam. So they got all the power. So, so they, were, they weren't having a difficult no, no, no. They were actually making life difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <at some> point. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Yes. yes all right. Sure, sure. Thanks. I just had one question sure. regarding the defacement of the icons. Yeah. Was that done secretly or openly? Well, it was done uh, in a way secretly because they were hiding in, in, yeah. in the temples when they were hiding, so they could do it. I mean, yeah. they haven't done it in front of the, the, the followers or the believers of this uh, religion right. because the temples were neglected by them. Right. Yeah, uh, we have to understand that when the Romans were in Egypt, uh, those religious sites were neglected, okay. not like the Greeks. The okay. Greeks were still practicing and, okay. and showing a great respect to the Egyptian gods and okay. so on. But the Romans, they didn't, so it went barely together. Uh, that The Romans neglected the, 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 the temples of Egypt, okay. so they were not guarded, not looked after, and it was a very good place for the daily Christians to hide. Ah. So they were hiding, so they were like ah. a deserted ah. sites, and remote sometimes, so they they lived in them, and uh, they they were damaging uh, the figures. And so it was during the conversion, so it was exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much, well, and thank you so much. Thank I you. Appreciate this. Thank, thank you. you. So. Oh, I'm not asking questions. I'm was Cleopatra the last Ptolemy? Yes, you're right. And what came after Cleopatra? Uh, the Romans. The Romans took over. 
Yeah. And whom did they install as a the king? They had no king of Egypt uh, by the time of the Romans. They used to send uh, uh, generals or field marshals or governors. Uh, it, it was not the Romans were not like the Greeks. The Greeks lived here, born here, educated here, and got I mean in Egypt. Uh, but uh, the Romans no. Uh, How do you say Cleopatra in, in, in Arabic? Cleopatra. Thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. Let me enjoy it. Come back again, Bob. Come back tomorrow night. Ancient Egypt, uh, Egyptian religion. What time? 7.30.